Okay. Good. I'm gonna just Matthias, I don't know if you are talking, but I think we cannot hear you. Am I the only one? I, I can't hear what's... what's you means. can or you cannot, sorry. No, <laughs> cannot. Briefly uh, show my breakdown. Uh, Matthias, I think I can, because you are cutting. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll introduce you, Richard, and <laughs> sorry for the... Uh, so, yeah, I'm sorry for the for the technical... So today is very nice to have Richard Davison from Herio Watt University in Scotland. So he will tell us about relations between transport and chaos in holographic theories. Please, Richard. Well. Thanks very much, uh, Daniel. Um, and thanks to uh, all the organizers for arranging this uh, interesting series of seminars um, and for giving me the, the chance to talk today. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, some work I've been doing over the last uh, three years or so. Um, which is about exploring uh, some relations between transport and chaos um, in holographic theories. Uh, so hopefully you can all see my uh, screen and my cursor here. Um, and if you have a question, then uh, please let me know. Okay, um, so the sort of main uh, zeroth order message uh, in my talk is, is contained in the title, uh, which is that um, in some uh, quantum field theories, in particular those that have a a, a classical uh, gravitational description, and um, there are some connections uh, between transport properties um, and the underlying uh, chaotic dynamics. <clears throat> so this idea um, uh, is not new, uh, and it was first proposed uh, about four years ago now um, by Blake. And so what um, first motivated him to suggest this um, uh, was that he looked at a particular kind of transport process, um, the diffusion of a, of a U1 charge, um, in certain kinds of uh, holographic states. And uh, what he observed um, was that the diffusivity of this process um, could be written um, in a very simple uh, form uh, when you expressed it um, in terms of the parameters um, that govern the, the underlying uh, chaotic dynamics um, of those same states. Okay, um, so this um, particular relation uh, between this transport process um, and, and, and chaos uh, it turns out um, it's not very robust. Um, so what I mean by that is just that sort of even within the confines of, of holographic theories, um, that um, this is not very general um, and it only works if you have a, a particular kind of, of state, uh, which is relatively simple. Um, but the more, you know, the sort of general idea of the proposal um, is correct and, and there are, um, we can identify much more uh, robust relations and general relations um, between um, transport um, and chaos, um, particularly in holographic theories. Um, and so that's what I want to uh, explain today. And I'm going to talk uh, almost completely about um, field theories that have a gravity description, um, although there has also been a little bit of work um, looking in this context at other kinds of theories too. Okay. Uh, so before I get into the sort of the details and the results, uh, let me first of all um, give some sort of brief uh, motivation about why one might be interested in um, uh, in transport properties, um, particularly in, in holographic systems. Um, so, so transport properties um, are just certain properties of a system that characterize uh, the dynamics um, of that system's uh, conserved charges um, over some suitably, suitable uh, length and time scales. So a simple example uh, would be the electrical resistivity of a metal, which is just one way of parameterizing dynamics uh, of a U1 charge. Another example would be the shear viscosity of a liquid, which is a way of, of telling you how efficiently your liquid conducts momentum, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and these um, particular properties uh, of a system um, are quite important um, in the real world uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Uh, so one of those, the first one, um, is that um, although these are quite sort of uh, crude uh, measures of, of what's going on inside a system, um, these, these particular properties uh, are quite easy to measure. Um, and so that means relatively quite a lot is known about them um, ex you know, from experiments um, in, in real materials, real systems. 
Um, the second reason um, is that um, there are some interesting kinds of materials, strongly correlated materials or, or systems, um, in which some of these transport properties um, can, to some degree, exhibit some, some universality. And so in that sense, uh, transport properties um, look quite simple, um, and it's plausible that um, there's, um, a, a, you know, we can understand them or we can explain them um, um, without um, an extremely detailed uh, microscopic understanding of the details of some particular material that you happen to be looking at. Okay, so this is um, sort of, in reality, why, why transport properties are, are an interesting thing. <clears throat> now, in the, the simplest types of uh, many body states, um, we know what the low energy degrees of freedom are that are responsible for, for carrying charge and carrying energy and so on. Um, and, and those are um, you know, underlying quasi-particle degrees of freedom. <clears throat> and so in cases like that, um, if we want to understand the transport properties, uh, what we first need to do uh, is understand what are the properties of these underlying uh, quasi-particles, um, and then use kinetic theory or some other similar approach to kinetic theory um, to extract from that uh, what the transport properties that this, this system will display are. Um, but of course, uh, there are many interesting systems um, um, and uh, mysterious systems um, in which uh, we don't think there is a quasi-particle description. So the, the in, if you like, the interactions are strong enough uh, that there is no uh, description anymore in terms of underlying quasi-particles. Um, and so in cases like that, um, we're basically left with this question of, well, what should the transport properties be um, in a system which doesn't have this, this underlying uh, quasi-particle description? And so it was this question really that got me interested um, in, in thinking about these uh, relations between uh, chaos um, and transport. Okay. So um, mathematically, the, the objects um, of interest in the, in the quantum field theory for, for that contain the kind of simplest transport properties um, are the retarded Green's functions uh, of the conserved charge density operators. Um, so an example, um, if you had a system with a conserved energy, would be the retarded Green's function of the energy density epsilon, um, which I'm writing here in, in Fourier space. Um, and so this is just the linear response function, which tells you um, how does the energy density in my system change um, if I turn on a small source? Uh, and one particular um, aspect of these Green's functions that I'm going to uh, refer to a lot um, and that contains a lot of the interesting transport information um, is the locations of the poles um, of, of Green's functions uh, of conserved charges and specifically of the energy density. So the poles um, in, 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 in Fourier space of this object I just tell you if you turn on a source with this particular wave number and this particular frequency, then you'll get a huge response in your system. Um, and so that's just uh, telling you that you have a collective mode of your system uh, living at that frequency and that wave number. And so by just uh, finding out, calculating where are the poles uh, of this Green's function, and um, that tells us what are the dispersion relations of the collective modes that carry charge and that carry energy and that carry momentum um, and so on. Um, and so by computing them, we, we get access to um, a lot of the interesting transport information um, that we would like to know. <clears throat> now, uh, unfortunately, the, these Green's functions uh, are very complicated objects, um, and they depend a lot on exactly which system it is you happen to be looking at. Uh, but there are some general features that, that we can identify, um, which sort of restricts to some extent uh, the, the, the form uh, of these Green's functions. Um, and are valid even for the cases of most interest, um, which are those um, in which there is no, no quasi-particle um, description. <clears throat> so um, specifically, um, if we have a system um, which achieves local thermal equilibrium, um, then provided we, we probe it on, on long enough length scales, on long enough time scales, um, then the transport um, will be governed by a, a simple kind of um, effective theory uh, which is which is called a hydrodynamic theory. Um, and what that means that is in, in the appropriate regime, uh, which um, in Fourier space is, is small, small energies, small wave numbers, uh, it means that the transport uh, will then just be dominated. So the, this retarded Green's functions of the charge densities uh, will just be dominated 
uh, by a handful um, of, of collective modes uh, which are gapless. Uh, and these are just the hydrodynamic uh, modes of the system. Um, and they will have some dispersion relation whose functional form uh, you can relatively easily um, predict. Okay, so just to try and illustrate that, uh, what I mean by that uh, with an example for, for, people, for anyone who's, who's not familiar with this, um, you can think of a, a simple example um, of, of a system like this whose only conserved charge is total energy. Then if I am, think about small perturbations of that system, um, and I assume we're in local thermal equilibrium, um, then that means I can, I can characterize the state uh, by, by a single function, uh, which is a, a local energy density epsilon. Um, and this, this, so this epsilon is the hydrodynamic variable in this case, um, and I can assume that it varies slowly um, in space and time. Okay. So this is my hydrodynamic variable. Um, its dynamics are not completely arbitrary because we know it, this thing has to obey a local conservation equation, um, which relates the time, its time derivative um, to the energy current flowing in the system. And therefore, to have a, a complete description of our, of our system, just in terms of this variable, uh, all we need to do is relate the energy current uh, to the hydrodynamic variable epsilon itself. Okay, and the way we do that um, is to um, take a kind of effective uh, field theory type approach um, and is to write down um, the uh, most general relation between uh, an energy current and an energy density uh, that's allowed, um, which is allowed with, you know, taking into account the symmetries of our system. So we'd write down all the possible terms allowed by the symmetries, um, each with an arbitrary coefficient. Um, and we, we structure that relation um, by writing it out um, as a power series um, in powers of, of derivatives of, of, of the hydrodynamic variable. So you know, we're assuming this is slow, slowly varying, so its derivatives are small, and so it's sensible uh, to write out um, an expansion um, in powers of derivatives. Okay, um, so this is basically the sort of basic cartoon essence uh, of hydrodynamics. Um, and what we get by doing this um, in this particular example, we get um, a single equation here for the hydrodynamic variable, which is the energy density, um, which is written in a derivative expansion um, with some, some arbitrary coefficients uh, multiplying each term. So d and gamma and, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> uh, and to, you know, what this means, um, to see what this means, we, if we look just at the first term on the right hand side, so we can imagine going to very long distances, uh, where only the first term is important. Um, we can see that this is just a diffusion equation for energy density. So it's telling us that at long enough scales, um, sort of independent of the microscopics, um, energy is going to diffuse. Okay, and then there will be systematic corrections to this that become more and more important at shorter distances. Or if we just Fourier transform this, we find out there's a single collective mode in the system, uh, which is gapless um, and whose, whose dispersion relation has, has this particular functional form here. So it's written as a, a power series that's uh, uh, sensible at small wave numbers k. Okay, so this was a kind of simple example um, and the kind of systems I'm gonna be talking about in general uh, are more complicated than this. So they have many more conserved charges and their hydrodynamics uh, can, you know, is more complicated. Um, but the same principle applies um, that by um, just, uh, restricting ourselves to very long distances and long times um, and taking into account the symmetries of the problem and um, we can put some restrictions on the structure of this Green's function um, at small omega and small k. Okay, so this um, is obviously quite helpful um, but it also it doesn't really tell us everything we want to know and um, so it doesn't tell us anything about um, what happens outside the hydrodynamic limit or even when the hydrodynamic limit is really valid um, quantitatively. Um, and furthermore, even within the hydrodynamic limit, it doesn't tell us everything we need to know um, because it doesn't tell us anything about what are the actual values of these parameters turning up in the effective theory. So for some given system with some given microscopics, you know, what is the value of D? How quickly does energy diffuse? Um, so hydro doesn't tell us that. Um, and, um, and for that, we need some, we need some more microscopic understanding um, of, of our particular system. So um, 
So this is where um, kinetic theory, for example, comes in. If I have an underlying quasi-particle description, um, like in a Fermi liquid, um, I can use that to compute the values of these effective parameters. Um, so in a Fermi liquid, this, this diffusivity is just given by the, the Fermi velocity squared uh, multiplied by the lifetime of the, the fermionic quasi-particle. Um, but in systems where there are no quasi-particles, uh, this, you know, this procedure obviously doesn't work. Um, and so uh, we need some, some other um, way to, to or, yeah, we need some, yeah, we would like to know uh, what, is, uh, what sets these transport coefficients um, when we don't have the quasi-particles. Okay. So um, what I, I'm going to explain in the talk um, that is th this particular object, the, the retarded Green's function of the energy density, um, quite generally in holographic theories, um, is, is in certain ways quantitatively related uh, to an object which um, seems in advance to be quite different, um, and that is that it's related. Um, Hi, to Richard. I have a question. Yep. Uh, yeah, for that, uh, the fluctuations of why, why the fluctuations of the conserved energy density is not, uh, uh, cannot be uh, sound like? They always be di diffusive? And no, so, so in this particular example, it is diffusive. Um, and that's because I've assumed uh, that the only conserved charge uh, is the energy. So I'm assuming um, over very long distances and very long time scales, uh, the only hydrodynamic variable um, is this thing epsilon. Um, and this, this means um, when I write my constitutive relation for the energy current, which is essentially telling me the first term on the right hand side here, um, that the, at leading order, the energy current is given by the derivative uh, of the energy density. But of course, if I have more hydrodynamic variables, if I have more symmetries, like if I have a conserved momentum, then I can write more general things on the right-hand side here. Um, and in those situations, I can get a more complicated structure of hydrodynamic modes. And so I can get, in that particular example, I will get a sound wave. Um, oh, oh, okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, so, so this, uh, I'm sort of presenting this as a sim simple example, um, but in reality, you know, the hydrodynamics of the systems I'm talking about will be more complicated than this. Um, but they will, I should let me say that just now, they will all contain a diffusive mode which carries energy, um, as well as sound waves and various other things. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so what I um, want to explain to you is that this retarded Green's function of the energy density um, is related to um, something which seemed to be quite different, um, which is um, the four-point functions uh, that are used to characterize um, chaotic behavior um, in quantum field theories. So cha chaos, uh, kind of heuristically, um, is the sort of the notion that um, uh, if you make a small perturbation to your system at some time, um, then um, at a much later time, that perturbation will have a huge effect um, on the state, on, on the subsequent state. And so one way you can, you can try and quantify that um, in a field theory um, is to look at this kind of uh, correlation function, uh, which is the thermal expectation value of the squared commutator um, of two uh, generic local operators, V and W, that are separated uh, from one another in time and are separated from one another in space. And so this, this, this cor correlator here is, is a way of kind of quantifying, if you like, um, if I perturb my system at time zero and position zero with some operator W, what is the effect that that has later on um, on, the, on the measurement of, of a, you know, a different part of my system, V, um, at some distant point in time and some distant point in space. Okay, so this um, looks different than a retarded Green's function of energy density, um, and it is, um, and um, something, that, um, something that's been studied a lot um, recently, um, and sort of one of the most uh, basic and important observations about it um, is that in theories that have a, a, a classical gravity description, um, these correlations uh, all have a very similar form. Um, and that is they grow exponentially in time over some time scale tau L. Um, so this is, if you like, a signal that, that uh, 
these strongly interacting theories that have gravitational descriptions are very chaotic. These correlations grow um, exponentially in time, um, and they also decay exponentially in space. Okay, and what's particularly interesting about this, um, this growth in time um, is the time scale that characterizes it uh, is almost completely independent uh, of the details of which particular theory you happen to be talking about, um, provided it has a, a gravitational jewel. So in particular, the, the, this time scale is set only by the inverse temperature um, and it's independent of, of everything else. Um, now, since there's exponential growth in time and decay in space, that means we can, we can define a speed, uh, Vb, uh, which is called the butterfly velocity. If you, and if you like, this sort of characterizes how these correlations uh, spread um, in space. Um, and this is a bit more sensitive to details of your particular theory. So it doesn't just depend on temperature, um, but it depends on, on other aspects of the theory. And I'll, I'll give a, a more precise um, expression for this later on. Um, but the important thing about it um, is that in, in theories, in gravitational theories, this form of the correlation um, is, is basically set by the, the physics of what's happening near the horizon. Um, and so this particular speed, Vb, um, at the end of the day, only depends on, on what your near horizon metric looks like um, in the gravity description. Okay, so this is kind of uh, in one slide, a small cartoon of, of um, some way of measuring the chaotic dynamics in a field theory. Um, and what I want to um, let me now give you a summary of the kind of the two, the two main results I, I want to describe to you um, about how, how the transport properties um, are related to these, um, these parameters. So um, I want to explain that quite generally the transport properties um, are, are constrained precisely by VB, this butterfly velocity, um, and this time scale tau L. And there's two in the, you know, somewhat independent results that I'm going to explain in turn. So the, the first of these um, is very uh, general, um, and it is that in, in holographic theories, quite generally, there is always um, a collective mode transporting energy. So that means there's always a pole of the energy density retarded Green's function, uh, whose dispersion relation has to obey um, exactly this equation written here. So what this is saying is, um, if I take my dispersion relations for my pole, my poles, um, and I allow them not just to be functions of real wave number k, but I analytically continue the wave number and allow it to be imaginary, then when my wave number equals this particular combination of the butterfly velocity and tau l, I have to have a pole um, sitting at energy i times tau l. Okay, sort of to a large extent. Um, independent of the details of the holographic theory. And so um, this is, you know, quite a um, uh, surprise. I mean, to me, anyway, this was quite a surprising result because it's telling you that, you know, normally the structure of the collective excitations of your theory um, is very sensitive to exactly what theory you're talking about. Um, but actually, in all theories with a classical gravity dual, um, there's one particular feature which they all have to have, you know, independent of their details. And so this will be the sort of first result I'll explain. So I'm going to describe, uh, you know, the kind of general proof of this or explanation of this, if you like, from this paper here. Um, but let me also say that you know, we were not the first people to realize this was happening. But so this was first realized by uh, these, these three authors here um, in the context of the Schwarzschild black brain. Okay. So that's the first result. Uh, and the second one uh, is sort of uh, different, but to some extent related um, um, and applies slightly less generally. So, so the second result um, applies um, in, in an appropriate limit, which turns out to be the limit of low temperatures. Um, and that is that in this limit, um, the diffusive transport of energy, um, which has its associated diffusivity D, um, this diffusivity D um, is set um, precisely by VB and tau L. So what this is saying um, is that um, although um, we don't have, there's no quasi-particle description here, um, there is still a natural uh, time scale, a natural velocity scale, uh, which is setting you know, the rate at which energy diffuses, um, but it's, they're no longer the time and speeds you know, coming from some quasi-particle description. Um, but it's this time and speed 
that characterize uh, chaos in the system that are setting this transport coefficient. Okay, so that's kind of, that, that's the two main results that I am gonna explain. Um, and before I explain where they're coming from, uh, let me give a non-gravitational um, interpretation uh, or explanation of, of how you could or should interpret these things. Okay, so the first result, so this um, relation between the spectrum of poles um, and the four-point correlation function um, is actually the prediction um, of um, a proposal um, by these three authors here, which, which predates our predates the, the holographic proof of it. So these three authors um, suggested that the reason um, in theories with a classical gravitational description um, that this four point correlation function always has the same form um, is because there's um, a simple effective theory uh, governing this process um, and all these, all these systems. Um, and in particular, um, so they wrote down an effective field theory um, in which they suggested that the, the, the exponential growth of these four-point functions um, comes um, just from the operators V and W exchanging a single effective degree of freedom that they called sigma. Okay, and this effective degree of freedom um, is essentially the hydrodynamic mode um, for the conservation of energy. Um, okay, and from this effective theory, the, you know, the, um, Came with, you know, they came with some predictions, uh, one of which um, is the holographic result I'm going to explain to you. And so from this point of view, the reason that chaos and transport are related to one another, um, at least in theories with the gravitational dual, um, is because both of these processes are at the end of the day governed just by the dynamics of the energy density. Um, and so they're not really independent of one another, uh, and in fact they're quantitatively um, related. Uh, Richard, a good question. Um, uh, so my standard question is always like, oh, it's all very beautiful, but does it apply to mundane liquids like water? I think in the meantime, I get an answer not quite because it's really hard quiet. And the fact that you have this zero temperature conformal field theory, blah, blah, uh, that's really very, very different from, uh, you know, normal matter like water. When you say that it's all rooted in energy conservation, that sounds like it could apply to water. Yeah, so, so, I, so I would say it's kind of, hopefully it's clear that transport is something closely related to the dynamics of energy. So the sort of non-trivial part of this um, is that in theories that have a gravitational description, yeah. all the chaotic behavior comes from some very simple Feynman-like diagram where a yeah. exchange of a single mode, which is basically the energy. And I think when you talk to a... Uh, uh, classical uh, liquid specialists, right? there's an enormous business out there trying to compute the viscosity of water, etc. They will say, no way, how can you dream this up? That's extremely complicated and contrived and, you know, uh, you have to know all the details of water molecules, blah, 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 in order to get anywhere, right? I, I guess that's still sending up that. Your right, yeah. So, so of CFTs uh, that, that simplify it. Exactly, yeah. So it, it's sort of the, yeah, the simplification from the point of view of this, this chaos is that, you know, the, everything boils down to the exchange of energy, which in gravitational language means everything just comes from gravitational, inter, you know, gravitational interactions dominate this particular correlator. And if yeah. your theory doesn't have a gravity limit, that's presumably not true. Yeah. So there's, there's been, uh, I know there's some kind of ongoing work, which sounds interesting, um, looking at um, sort of taking the SYK model and looking at non-gravitational uh, corrections to it. And there you begin to see, um, you know, differences in these exact relations between chaos and transport um, because of, you know, this particular effective theory is not as simple anymore. Okay. So that's sort of the first, the first uh, uh, result and sort of where it's coming from. Um, and this, the second result, so I mentioned that this, this is less general um, and in some sense you can, um, this, you can think of this as arriving uh, as a consequence of the first result within some um, appropriate limits. <clears throat> so the first result was there has to be a quasi-normal mode um, satisfying this uh, equality um, related to the chaos parameters. 
Um, and I'm going to make two further assumptions to that. So the first is that it's not just any old, uh, any old uh, collective mode satisfying this constraint, but it's in fact one of the hydrodynamic modes. So in particular, this means that if I assume that it's one of the hydrodynamic dispersion relations uh, that passes through this particular point in Fourier space. <clears throat> okay. Then secondly, if I make a, what seems like an even more um, uh, restrictive approximation, uh, which is that at this wave number, so at this wave number that I'm calling K star, the, the simple diffusive approximation to hydrodynamics uh, is accurate. So that means the, you know, the, the first order hydrodynamics, the K squared part of the dispersion relation um, is the most important part and the corrections to this are small at this particular wave number. And then what that means is I just substitute this into the equality above, then that means that the diffusivity um, will just be set by VB squared multiplied by tau L. So if you like the, you know, the real exact equivalence between chaos and transport um, is the first result. Um, and then under appropriate conditions, you can use that to get information um, about specific transport coefficients, um, like the diffusivity of energy. Okay, so that's kind of the, yeah, hope, you know, that's the sort of um, interpretation uh, or explanation I would like to, to give to these holographic results. Um, although, um, you know, I can't prove these exact explanations and interpretations as of right now. Okay, so let me move on now to explain um, where these, you know, why are these results true? Um, so um, I'm going to be be discussing um, asymptotically ADS2, sorry, ADSD plus two black brains um, supported by matter fields um, whose metric has the, has the following form. Okay, so this is written in ingoing coordinates, uh, V here, um, and it's characterized by two functions, F of R and H of R. Um, and these things, I'm gonna specifically consider solutions like this that arise um, from a gravitational action, which is an Einstein, Maxwell, Dilaton, uh, axion type action um, with some general scalar V of phi um, and general gauge coupling, sorry, scalar potential and gauge coupling Z of phi um, and uh, further coupling here Y of phi. And I'm going to allow myself um, to have solutions uh, in which the matter fields um, are non-trivial and so they induce some RG flow from a CFT in the UV to something much more complicated in the IR. So I'm going to allow myself to have a scalar field that runs in the radial direction. Um, I'm going to allow a radial electric field um, and I'm going to allow um, these scalar fields chi i um, to break translational symmetry um, in a particular way and by making their, uh, their uh, sources proportional to the, the spatial coordinates of the field theory. Okay, so um, this is the kind of general type of solutions I'm going to look at. So this includes Schwarzschild ADS and Riser Nordstrom ADS and lots and lots of you know huge numbers of different examples, um, most of which you can you can only construct numerically. Um, and these examples um, have can have different symmetries, um, and so they can have different hydrodynamics. So I'm not restricting the the I'm not demanding I have some particular hydrodynamic limit. I'm going to assume something. Uh, more general than that um, and you know, prove something which is sort of independent of what the hydrodynamics happens to be. Okay. So let's say I want to compute the, the, the retarded Green's function of some operator in a state like this. Um, let me uh, recap how to do that, um, focusing on the simplest case, um, which will be enough to illustrate the main point, uh, which is the case of a scalar operator. Uh, which is dual to some scalar field, um, minimally coupled scalar field with mass m. Okay, so this guy has an equation of motion, classical equation that looks like that, um, and each Fourier mode of the field phi uh, will have two independent solutions. So it's going to have one which is normalizable near the ADS boundary, and it's one going to have one that's non-normalizable near the ADS boundary. And to compute the retarded Green's function, uh, what I want to do is find these two solutions, then um, examine what they look like near the horizon of my black hole. I'll have some planar horizon um, and then you know, 
by examining them near the horizon, find the linear combination of them that is regular at the horizon um, in ingoing coordinates. Okay, so there'll be some particular linear combination uh, which is regular in this coordinate system near the horizon. Um, and once I found that combination, once I found these relative coefficients a and b, the retarded Green's function that I'm looking for is just given by the ratio of b over a. Okay, so this is probably very familiar to most people, but I'm going through the details because um, they will be important shortly. So this is in principle what I, what I would do to compute the Green's function of this operator. Um, uh, now in practice, um, it's, very, it's usually very complicated to do this, even for the very simplest cases, like a massless scalar in short shield ADS. Um, this can only be done numerically. Um, and so it turns out that the Green's functions and especially the ones I'm interested in, the Green's functions of the conserved charges, like the energy density, um, depend uh, in detail on exactly which gravitational background um, I happen to be looking at. Um, and that's just because um, basically I'm solving a boundary value problem. So if I want to relate my normalizable and non-normalizable solutions up here to find out their behavior near the horizon, I have to know exactly how they evolve through the whole space-time. And this depends in great detail on exactly what my space-time is. Okay, and so in field theory language, this just means like you expect, the Green's functions depend on exactly which state you're in, exactly which theory you're looking at. Okay, but there are two situations um, when this, um, when things actually become a lot more simple. Um, and in fact, in these two situations, um, only studying what's happening near the horizon is enough to tell us some definite things um, about the properties of the Green's function. So one of these situations is, is relatively well known, um, which is if you look at the limit of small frequencies and small wave numbers, um, what that means, so then things become simple. Um, and the reason for that is in the limit of small frequencies and small wave numbers, the radial evolution of your field, IMR, um, becomes very simple. So usually there'll be a, a radial conservation equation, um, which means if you know what's happening near the boundary, that tells you in a very simple way what's happening near the horizon. Um, and so you can extract the Green's functions in this particular limit um, without, you know, or, yeah, without a complicated uh, radial evolution. So this allows us, you know, this tells us things like DC conductivities uh, and so on. It, you know, allows us to express them just in terms of what's happening near the horizon. But there's a second um, uh, class of situations um, where, again, we can tell something specific about the Green's function um, without doing some complicated uh, radial evolution uh, of the solutions. Um, and that is, there are certain points in Fourier space, so certain pairs of values of, of omega and k, um, where there is no unique ingoing solution uh, to, the, to the perturbation equation. So what that means is, um, when, instead of looking for a particular linear combination of normalizable and non-normalizable modes, uh, that's regular at the horizon, um, there is no such unique uh, combination that's regular. And in cases um, where that's true, um, that means, in fact, we don't even need to do any radial evolution at all to, to tell us what's happening um, at the Green's function, to tell us what's happening with the Green's function. Um, and so, so this, when this happens, there's some features of the Green's function um, that become insensitive to many, many details of the state. Uh, and we're going to use that to, to prove this general statement. Okay, so yeah, the summary of what I'm going to explain is by identifying these particular points, I'm labeling omega star and k star, where the ingoing solution is not unique, that gives us uh, exact constraints on the spectrum um, of the quasi-normal modes, on the collective modes um, of the Green's function. And so to explain how this works, um, I'm going to first of all give a sort of very simple example, which is just this probe scalar field I mentioned before, um, because this contains all the kind of uh, essential information um, about where this is coming from. And then after this, I'll explain how it works for the case of the energy density operator that I'm really interested in. So let's imagine I want to compute um, the Green's function um, for the scalar operator. So first of all, let me make an ansatz. Um, so look for a solution for this scalar field um, that is regular at the horizon. So I'm going to write an ansatz near, you know, some Taylor series near the horizon 
um, for my scalar field. Okay, so just by definition, this, this is regular, this is ingoing. And then I could substitute this into my equations of motion um, and solve them order by order in an expansion near the horizon. So, you know, the first order equation I'll get um, gives me a relation between uh, phi one, so the, one of the coefficients here, um, and, and, the, and the zeroth order coefficient phi zero. Okay, and then I can go to higher and higher orders and express phi two in terms of phi one and phi zero, and so on and so forth. Um, and by solving these equations, order by order, um, what I'll find um, is, a, is a regular solution, um, which is unique up to just the, you know, just up, to, you know, up to its overall normalization phi naught. And so by doing this, I just construct the ingoing solution. Okay, so that's what one would normally do. But what you can see just from looking at this equation in here, um, is there's a certain value of the frequency and a certain value of the wave number um, when this equation I've written down is just identically satisfied on both, on both sides. So left and right hand side are both zero. Okay, and so what that means is um, this equation no longer fixes phi one in terms of phi naught. Um, and so now I can construct by the same procedure um, an ingoing solution that depends on two independent parameters. So it depends on some arbitrary value of phi naught and on some arbitrary value of phi one. Uh, and so this is just telling me at this frequency and at this wave number, there is no unique ingoing solution, but rather all solutions are ingoing. Okay, so this is quite uh, unusual and seems a bit strange that you know, there is no such, you know, there is no unique ingoing solution. Uh, so to understand um, what this means, um, it's helpful to look to perturb slightly away from this special value, uh, omega star and k star. So if we move infinitesimally away um, from omega star and k star, so by some amount delta omega and delta k, and again, solve the near horizon equations in this expansion, um, what we'll find um, is now we have, thankfully now we have a unique solution um, at this value of omega and k, um, but that the ratio of phi one to phi naught for this ingoing, you know, the ratio of phi one to phi naught for the ingoing solution um, now depends uh, strongly um, on the slope delta k over delta omega um, by which we've moved away from this special point. So what that's telling us is, you know, slightly away from this, this strange point in Fourier space, um, we now have a unique ingoing solution. And um, so now some particular combination of the normalizable and non-normalizable modes um, will be ingoing. But the particular combination that it is that's ingoing um, basically depends on which direction we move in. So that's what I'm writing in, in this equation here. The ingoing solution is some particular linear combination of the normalizable and non-normalizable modes, but the combination that it is depends on delta k over delta omega. Okay, and so if we extract from this expression here, we just take the ratio of these coefficients, that tells us what the Green's function the retarded Green's function of the operator looks like close to this point in momentum space. Um, and it has the following, it has this form written on the right hand side here. Okay, and what you can see from looking at this form is um, that there has to be, you know, what this point in Fourier space corresponds to um, is where there is a pole in the Green's function written on the bottom here, intersecting with the zero of the Green's function written on the top. Okay. And so, uh, therefore, the conclusion of this is at these points where there is uh, no unique ingoing solution, what that means is we have to have a pole um, whose dispersion relation passes through them. Okay. Okay. And so this is uh, interesting. And one of the reasons it's interesting um, is the locations of, you know, the, to identify where these points are, these special points in Fourier space, um, all we have to do is look at the dynamics near the horizon. We don't need to know anything else at all about the rest of the space time. Um, and we can get some constraints um, on the spectrum of modes. So if you like, what this procedure does um, is it tells you there's a part of the spectrum that actually is completely independent of the rest of the space time and is just fixed by what's happening at the horizon. Richard, uh, how does this hang together with the shock wave? I, I guess the shock wave, tells you a very similar story, right? But the language you're using is very different. Yeah, so the, the, so the shock wave, um, so the, 
the let's say the summary uh, of what I'm going to say is that the locations um, where um, there is no unique ingoing solution um, are given by solutions of the shockwave equation. Um, and so I think that is not obvious uh, in advance, um, but it happens to be true that the, the, the solutions to the, yeah, the solutions to the shockwave equation um, correspond to the modes for which there is no unique ingoing solution. Is it is the second statement more general than the shock wave? It sounds uh, which, a bit like it, right? It's as if the shock wave is kind of a specific solution that also satisfies it. But yeah, so yeah, so let me be clear that these solutions I'm talking about are not the shock wave. At least I don't think yeah. they are the shock, yeah. they aren't the shock wave. Yeah. But, but the conditions at which you have a shock wave solution are the same conditions at which you have uh, these these you know and non-uniqueness uh, of solutions to this, this particular yes. problem. But are they the same or are they coincidence? You mean, is it a coincidence the equations are the same? Yeah, yeah, so the shockwave, you know, uh, it, it, it really sounds very different, right? And, and what you're telling you is, is extremely general, it seems, right? It's just a property of the new horizon that you don't have the, these unique solutions. Right, yeah, so what I'm, uh, right, so yeah, maybe that's a good thing for me to clarify. What I'm explaining is yeah. just a fact that is true for any field yeah. in space time. It's nothing to do with, uh, you know, it's true for fermions, it's true for scalar fields. You can always do this. Um, and yeah. and uh, so you can always, yeah, you can always, for any field, uh, find these kind of constraints on your spectrum by doing this. But what um, is special about the, so you can always do that. And when you have, you know, for when you have a shockwave solution, uh, that tells, that gives you, um, actually, sorry, maybe if you let me continue, I can, I can, uh, once I get to the relevant part of our energy density perturbations, I can relate that to the shockwave. Okay, okay, yeah. So what I'm saying is much more general than just about the energy density Green's function. This is true for any Green's function uh, at the moment. Can, can I also have some? So, this is based on iterative relation between the zero, the phi naught and phi one, right? Does something similar happen in, in the relations of like higher coefficient? Yeah. So, uh, give me two seconds, and I'll. I will. So, so in the example I've just described, uh, you have this strange thing between phi one and phi naught, um, but all the other equations. Um, so at this particular frequency where, where, where this equation is identically satisfied, all the higher equations, uh, nothing special happens. Um, so, at, yeah, so, so. Okay, okay oh. but, but they don't give you other solution in the dispersive relation, right? No, no, so they do. So I'll, I'll come on to that in a second. Okay, okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you get these constraints. Um, so yeah, these constraints tell you part of the spectrum that is independent of the rest of the space time. Okay, and so let me make, so these two points. So one, first one here. So a more thorough analysis, I've just presented the kind of simplest possible thing here, actually gives you infinitely many constraints of this kind. So um, to the person who just asked that question, yes, you, by looking at higher order um, terms in this expansion, you can identify at each order, you get more and more and more of these constraints. And actually, you get infinitely many of these constraints, you know, if you looked at infinitely many orders in your near horizon expansion. Um, okay, and, you. and so in the example I just described of the scalar field, these were, so the one I presented is at frequency minus 2 pi it, and you would also get them at minus 4 pi it, 6 pi it, 8 pi it, and on and on and on and on. You can find more and more constraints at every multiple of two pi t. Um, so I'm just to illustrate this. I'm just showing um, here's a plot of a dispersion relation of the some uh, quasi-normal mode of the momentum density operator in Schwarzschild ADS4. So these black dots are you know exact computations of this from from some numerics. 
And these red stars are indicating where this near horizon analysis tells you there has to be, um, has to be a quasi-normal mode. And so I've just plotted three here, but you can see you know, there really is a quasi-normal mode passing through these points. Um, and there really is more than one of these points. In fact, there's infinitely many. Um, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Can, can you do something like this? You have charts and the black hole is extremal, or there is something that doesn't work in that case? Ah, so the extremal case, I don't know. So the extremal case um, uh, is a, I mean, that's an interesting question. I don't know. So the, the structure of the near horizon expansion will be very different for extremal black hole. I mean, this, 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 radial, ex, this radial expansion may not be the right, you know, may not be general enough for an extremal black hole. So I don't know if there's, if there's a generalization or not, but I think that would be interesting to know. Yeah. Okay. So, so I, I just gave you one example for a scalar field, but you can really do this for any kind of field. So, um, you know, okay. The momentum density operator is not a scalar field. It comes from part of the metric. Uh, there was a nice paper um, by these authors here where they looked at fermions and showed there's analogous things for the fermionic spectrum. Um, you know, you can do an analogous thing and, and derive uh, this infinitely many constraints on the spectrum for yeah for fermions. Okay. So this this was uh, this was okay. So this was for a scalar field, um, and um, the these special points you can identify from near the horizon, um, but they depend on things. As you can see here, this value of k it depends on what is the mass of the scalar field. Okay, so it depends on exactly which operator it is that you're looking at, where are these points actually, well, you know, what these constraints actually are. Um, and so you can try and do the same thing now, not for a scalar field, um, but for the energy density. So looking at certain perturbation um, of the metric and it's the equations that it obeys. Now in principle, this would seem to be much more complicated because the, the, time, the time component of the metric, which is what tells us about the energy density, couples to all of the other or most of the other metric perturbations and it couples to the perturbations of the matter fields and so on. And so you have some horrendous set of equations to solve. Um, and you know, you would think it would be more complicated, um, but in fact, the answer you get is even more simple for this case than it is for the other cases. So I've written here just one of the Einstein equations um, evaluated on the horizon, um, and what you can see by looking at the left-hand side here um, is if I just ignore, for now, the perturbations of the matter fields on the right-hand side, if I just look at the left-hand side, I can then identify some frequency and some wave number at which the equation is identically vanishing. And so at which I have to have a, a pole um, in the two-point function. And you would think this might be spoiled by the fact you have all this complicated matter stuff on the right-hand side. But it turns out that this particular Einstein equation um, on the horizon um, for the kinds of actions I wrote down before, that all these terms on the right-hand side identically cancel one another out. Um, and so the constraint you get just from naively looking at the left-hand side um, is true even for these complicated solutions with all these different matter fields turned on. So the, the constraint you get on the location of the pole um, is independent of the matter field profiles. Um, and you find that you will always have a pole um, at this particular value of omega um, and this particular value of k. Um, and if you rewrite those in terms of the chaos parameters, uh, you find um, that you will always have a pole um, at this particular wave number, k star, um, and this particular frequency, omega. And okay, yeah, so for the, so this is what happens to the energy density case. Um, you also get a whole infinitely many constraints, uh, but you find one particular constraint that's just completely independent of the matter field content um, and um, is related to the chaos parameters in this very simple way. And so to go back to Jan's question now, uh, I'm not sure if this is actually gonna help now that I've reached this point, but th this, these, this equation you get on the left-hand side here, this is the shockwave equation. So it's only for metric field perturbations that the shockwave equation turns up. And so it's only the energy density two-point function that really has this connection to chaos. Okay. So, so, so this is the kind of um, proof, if you like, or explanation of, 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 of 
where this result comes from, of how we can prove some things in general about the spectrum um, of this particular Green's function um, in holographic theories. Um, and so this is so this is more robust than what I've presented here. So there's been some nice, interesting works. Uh, in particular, looking at um, higher derivative corrections uh, to the gravitational action, um, and checking that you know these these same relations still still hold even if you look at um, at least some kinds of higher derivative corrections to the to the Einstein equations, um, and also it works um, in the presence of certain kinds of magnetic fields um, and for with chern simons like terms anomalies in your field theory, um, and so on. Okay. Uh, so that's the that's the the first result and why you know also hopefully you can see why this is robust because it's independent of the matter field so this is um, true quite generally. Okay, and now to move on to the second um, part, this connection to the diffusivity. Um, as I said before, we need to make two further assumptions um, for that to be a sensible thing to do. The first is we have to or you know we would like to assume that it's not just any old mode which passes through this point. Um, but it's one of the hydrodynamic modes which passes through this point. And I can't, I can't prove that to you. It's been checked in, in some simple examples, um, but I don't have a general proof. Um, one way you can, um, to, I mean, it's, it's reasonable to expect it to be one of the hydrodynamic modes for the following reason. So when k, k equals zero, if we look at the, the modes with zero wave number, we're gonna have a hydrodynamic mode sitting at the origin of the complex plane and then we're going to have some gap given, you know, approximately by the temperature probably before we have all the non-hydrodynamic modes. And then as we increase, you know, as we turn on the wave number, these modes are going to move around in the complex plane. And in particular, this hydrodynamic mode will always move upwards, which we can see from the structure of hydrodynamics. So when we turn on a complex, an imaginary wave number, this guy always moves upwards. Um, and so it's reasonable to expect that the mode which passes through omega equals plus two pi i t, which is somewhere up here, is going to be the hydrodynamic mode. Since it starts here and it moves upwards, it's likely to pass through this point rather than it being any of these non-hydro modes passing through that point. OK. So, so I have a question. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm Takaki Ishii. Um, so what, what's the physical meaning of adding this uh, imaginary momentum k? Uh, the, the, I mean, so in, in terms of the, the retarded Green's function itself, I mean, it is not, it is not physical to, to turn on an imaginary uh, wave number. You know, you would, that would be like turning on a source which grows uh, exponentially at, at large distances. Um, so, I mean, this, it's not, so it's, it, it's not physical in that sense. But if if you you know if you take k and analytically continue it, um, th then you then you will find this feature, um, and that can tell you things about things which are physical, like the diffusivity, for example. Um, you know, if, because if you analytically continue the hydrodynamic dispersion relation, uh, you know it still depends on these same transport coefficients, like the diffusivity that you're interested in. Thanks. Or if you look back to this chaos four point function, I mean, um, just to maybe help you see where this comes from. I mean, you can see if I think of this as the Fourier transform of something, it's gonna be something with a, an imaginary frequency and imaginary wave number. So that's kind of one way to see why you need to be looking at imaginary frequencies and wave numbers to see something like some connection. Makes sense, that makes sense, great. Okay, so um, yes, so uh, we'd like to, so in some cases, it's certainly a hydrodynamic mode that goes, goes through this point. Um, and for this to tell us anything about some low order transport coefficient, um, we would also need it to be the case um, that the dispersion relation of the hydrodynamic mode at this particular wave number um, is well approximated just by first order hydrodynamics, for example. Um, and again, I don't have a, I don't have a general proof or even understanding of when this is the case, um, but it's certainly the case um, 
some of, some of the time. So just to illustrate this, here's a picture. So this is a particular holographic theory called linear axion theory at low temperatures. Uh, so here, these black dots again is some exact um, um, points along the, the curve of the dispersion relation computed numerically. And what I've plotted on top of it is this, this blue line is the diffusive approximation to hydrodynamics, omega equals minus ITK squared. Um, and this particular point here um, is the special point omega star and K star, um, where we know the dispersion relation has to pass through. And so at least in this example, what you can see is near this, this special point, um, the diffusive approximation to hydrodynamics is really excellent. Um, and so for this theory, the diffusivity is going to be given almost exactly by VB squared times tau L. Hey, uh, I did this orientation. I know I find it very confusing. Um, so what we know is when you're dealing with normal matter, I take a Fermi liquid, right? And then you say there is the uh, zero sound and first sound regime. Right, so the first time is about hydrodynamical size, you live at a finite uh, temperature, right? And when you're very, very precise about it, uh, the, the finite temperature from liquid continues to a classical gas at high temperature, so that's not a dynamical mode. And you have the zero sound, which is an exquisitely, you know, zero temperature uh, phenomenon. It's basically about the vibration of the Fermi sphere, right? There's no uh, a finite temperature difference for it. Now, this scale, right, um, this case star, omega star scale is this temperature itself, in essence. Now, how can it yeah, be yes. that you have this hydrogen mode that goes straight through this point where you would think that you cross over from a zero sound like to a first sound like thing? Have you any clue? Right. So, so that is basically the mystery here is. Mystery, right? Um, yeah. So, what I'm saying should sound uh, very, you know, strange. What I'm saying is, at frequencies of order the temperature, we can trust the first approximation, the first order hydrodynamics. When really you would expect hydrodynamics should be breaking down at frequencies. Way, of order. way below that scale, right? And it's somehow insistently going on there, which is, which is we agree, right? mysterious. Exactly, it's mysterious. So I don't, I can't sort of, I don't know exactly when this is happening or more quantitatively, if someone gave me, you know, I, I don't know, what is the regime of validity of hydrodynamics and why is it that in some cases first order the order hydrodynamics works essentially perfectly of, of a huge range of energies i don't know the answer um but i include this picture so you can hopefully see that it is it is true even though it's very strange <laughs> um yeah well i can make a comment which is um typically you have a quasi normal mode whose dispersion relation is given by Hyder. So let's say the next correction to momentum will be given by the second order Hyder equation. And then you have the other quasi normal modes which are not hydrodynamic. So Hyder is valid as long as the hydrodynamic mode is the mode closest to the real axis. Yeah, no, so, so yeah, so, so I, I agree with that. Um, but what is strange about Oh, sorry, did I interrupt you? No, no. Uh, so what I was going to say was, what is strange about these examples, so for, I don't have it in this plot here, is there are other quasi-normal modes who are, who are sort of with, within this, with, would be near this picture, you know, are not parametrically far away from what I'm drawing here, but somehow hydrodynamics still works amazingly well um, for, this, for this particular mode. Yeah, yeah, so the dispersion relation is given by hydro, but that doesn't mean that it is hydrodynamical, because if you look at the correlator, they might be dominated by other modes. Right? Yeah, so, so I, I agree, I agree. So uh, yeah, all I'm saying is that the, the dispersion relation of this particular mode uh, looks very similar to what first order hydrodynamics would tell you it would be, um, even though you're, you're outside of what you would naively think um, would be a sensible uh, hydro limit. Yeah, I think typically this mode is given by dynamics close to the horizon, and the other modes are given by dynamics away from the horizon. So that's why this mode, uh, the dispersion relation is given by Hydra. No, oh, okay, okay. I guess uh, what I'm saying is that, um, yeah, maybe we're saying the same thing, and I, I'm misunderstanding that. Um, the the dispersion relation. Uh, 
what, what's surprising is that the first order hydrodynamic dispersion relation works um, at, at uh, frequencies or wave numbers, let's say, where naively the higher order corrections are of the same size as the first order term. But somehow they all cancel one another out near this point. Ah, okay, I see. That would be nice. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, so I think I'm already over time. So let me just skip to, to saying, um, so instead of just giving you this, this one picture and saying, oh, in this particular example, it seems like this, um, this um, the, the, the constraint on this mode translates into some constraint on the diffusivity. Um, you know, there are, of course, well-known independent ways to, to compute these diffusivities. Um, and what you find um, is that this relation between diffusivities and the chaos parameters is not some weird thing about this particular theory I wrote down before, um, but it's actually true quite generally. So for a large class of theories, that have in the IR uh, ADS2 fixed points, like for example, the Reisner Nordstrom black hole, then what you find in the limit of zero temperature is that the diffusivity is given exactly by VB squared times tau L. So what this is telling you in the context of what I described before is that at this particular wave number, um, first order hydrodynamics is just exact and all, of, all corrections to it identically cancel one another out. Um, so of course, uh, generically, you wouldn't have an ADS2 fixed point in the IR. Um, you, 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 more generic than that is to have a fixed point with some um, um, anisotropic uh, space-time scaling symmetry parameterized by a critical exponent z. Um, and in those cases, um, if you take the limit uh, of, of low temperatures, you find, again, the diffusivity is related uh, in a very simple way to vb squared tau l. Um, but now there's a, a universal coefficient out the front that just depends um, on the critical exponent of the fixed point. Uh, and finally, of course, there's an exception to these, you know, to, you know there's an obvious exception uh, in this equation here, which is when z equals to one. So when z equals to one, uh, the diffusivity is no longer set uh, by vb squared tau l, um, but instead it's parametrically larger, as you can see from this equation. Um, and in the context of what I discussed before, the reason for this is just that we know for theories with z equals to one, and um, the diffusive approximation to hydrodynamics breaks down uh, energy is much, much smaller than the temperature. So there's some other quasi-normal modes uh, close, much closer to the origin. You know, it's distance to the origin is much smaller than the, than the temperature. Um, so the diffusive approximation to hydrodynamics definitely does not apply um, near the special point in Fourier space. And so in those cases, the diffusivity is not related uh, to VB squared tau L anymore. So this last set includes the Schwarzschild black brain. Okay, so there, you know, so there is no, as someone mentioned at the very start of the talk, in just Schwarzschild black brain, there is no diffusive transport of energy. Um, so, so this relation between diffusivity uh, does not apply in that case. Okay, so let me just stop there with a summary um, to say the three main points are, there are some connections between transport properties and the underlying chaotic dynamics. Um, in particular, the most robust of these um, you can see by looking um, um, at, at exact constraints on the dispersion relations uh, of collective modes um, that are imposed by, by near horizon considerations. Uh, and what you'll find um, is if you look at collective modes of the energy density, there's a universal constraint that's independent of the matter field profiles and is there in you know, a very big class of holographic theories, uh, which is that there has to be a, a mode whose dispersion relation passes through this point. Um, and under appropriate conditions, uh, what that means um, is, or, and the appropriate conditions seem to be at low temperatures, and um, it means that the, the diffusivity um, of the mode carrying energy um, is related to VB squared uh, times tau L. Um, okay, and I had some list of open questions, but I think since I'm already 10 minutes over, I'll just stop talking and, and let you read that yourselves. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot, Richard. Um, very nice talk. Um, let's see. I mean, let's see if there are questions. I mean, yeah, we have time for questions. So just when it, who, who needs to leave can leave, of course. Uh, we have plenty of questions, but uh, 
if anyone wants to ask a question, just please go ahead. <laughs> no questions? Well, okay. Ah, yeah, you have a question. Yeah, um, I'm back from the abyss. Uh, okay. My, my connection cut out, sorry about that. Um, Richard, a question about the validity um, of, of hydrodynamics that you raised. Um, there's the, the arguments that resurgence um, and resummation um, extends the um, range of hydrodynamics in a certain way, right? Um, it might this just be what what we're seeing here because um, I mean that's the argument um, in simple simple um, cases that um, people have put forward and and said um, shown that that for example the lowest quasi normal mode can be reconstructed uh, the lowest non hydrodynamic quasi normal mode can be reconstructed from the um, three summation or summation of the hydrodynamic modes. Um, contributions, uh, der uh, derivative contributions. So do you think that might explain the question, like the validity that you and Carlos discussed earlier? Um, I don't know. So I think these are uh, all interesting, um, interesting points, which I'm trying to think about. So, um, so let me just try and ex explain uh, uh, my why I'm confused about this and maybe so I, the answer is maybe what you're saying is helpful. Um, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, but I think it's certainly something worth thinking about. So, so what I'm, what I basically find confusing is let's say I look at riser Nordstrom black hole. Okay. So that tell, you know, for riser Nordstrom black hole at small temperatures, the diffusivity is given exactly by this relation. Um, and that's telling me if I just naively stick in first order hydrodynamics. So if I take this constraint I have and assume first order hydrodynamics is perfect, the diffusivity has to be given by this. So somehow first order hydrodynamics is an amazingly good approximation um, to the dispersion relation of this mode at a frequency of two pi t. Um, and that is very strange to me because the, you know, the non-hydrodynamic modes all have lifetimes of order two pi t. The, the lowest, let's say, the first non-hydrodynamic mode has a lifetime of order the temperature. So that means hydrodynamics should start breaking down somewhere near omega equals two pi t. But instead of breaking down, it's in fact becoming incredibly accurate. And I just don't understand why. You know, if the Let's say if the radius of convergence of hydrodynamics is set by the distance to the next quasi-normal mode, it doesn't make any sense to me that hydrodynamics keeps working at these energy scales because there's lots of other quasi-normal modes there. Yeah. So uh, may I follow up? Or? Can I just say something, maybe in relation to this? Uh, uh, so I, I just wanted to say, so, so, so the radius of convergence of hydrodynamics is not determined by the distance to the next mode, but it's determined by the place where the hydro mode collides with the next mode, right? right. So it, it can happen that, so we, we proved these statements in there was a recent papers with, with Andre Starinets and, and Pavel Kofton and Peter Tadic. Um, I guess this is this, yeah, this is this Grostano right. et al. Um, so, so, yeah, so we, you can show that hydrodynamics, the, the infinite series, is a convergent series. Uh, this also implies that, at least for this, for, for momentum space considerations, resurgence is irrelevant because, you know, resurgence is only important to be discussed when you have an asymptotic series, and in momentum space, hydrodynamics is not an asymptotic series. So, I, I, yeah, so I guess, you know, it, it can happen that you will have a, a mode which will, you know, come into the regime of hydrodynamics, but the hydrodynamic mode will avoid it somehow in this complexified space of momentum and that they just won't collide. So if they don't collide, then the hydrodynamic series knows everything about this mode. So, you know, it can happen that, that, that it extends over the regime of the next mode because of this. Now, we know that hydro is convergent, so that's nice. I guess what we don't, and we see that hydro also converges quickly, uh, but like why it converges so quickly, uh, you know, why is it so incredibly well approximated by this first term? 
that's not clear. So like, you know, this point of chaos, what Richard was showing works really unbelievably well for t equals to zero. Uh, but it works, you know, Hydra works even if you don't take t to zero. So if you just take pure ADS Schwarzschild five, then we saw in this first paper with, with Kunrat and Vincenzo um, that, you know, this, this point of chaos was approximated by third order hydro up to 99%. Uh, so, you know, it's, and it's only third order hydro at finite temperature in a theory where there's no other scale. And so, you know, it still works extremely well. I don't know, that's just a few comments maybe in relation to what Matthias asked. Uh, yeah. Sorry, may I follow up? Of course, Matthias, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I don't wanna make this a question to, to Sasha, but maybe it's a, it's a comment. Um, so then, then it, means that if you extend the um, parameter space to into momentum into the complex momentum plane that you can um, continue the the validity of of hydro um, as an as a standard expansion as a true expansion is that, that a, i should read your paper uh, but maybe you can answer this Sergio. Uh, it depends i mean you can certainly analytically continue yes and then 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 you will get you know more out of it um. Uh, yeah, so uh, maybe we should talk about this separately. It's a it's a it's a subtle question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sorry, Richard. But, but yes, I mean the off, the answer is often yes, yes. <laughs> Thanks. You want to make any comment, Richard? Um, no, I don't think so. I think um, hopefully what is. Uh, I'd like to get a point across, I think, why hydro works so well and when exactly it doesn't, doesn't work um, is something that we don't really understand very well. And I think uh, what Sasho has been doing is very interesting and I would like to extend that or I think it would be good to know outside of Schwarzschild black brain for, let's say, in examples that in some sense are more complicated, but also in other senses like the results I'm presenting are much simpler, like low temperature limits of black brains. Um, it would be good to know what's happening there as well. Good. Richard, can I, can I ask two questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah, go ahead. So the, the first question is uh, regards the, the experimental paper by Benia group and, and the Arnold group, where they seem to see these uh, kind of relations, but they see it at very high temperature, not at low temperature. And I was wondering if you have a comment about that or because it looks completely different regimes where you don't expect any quantum physics or any butterfly velocity appearing at all. Uh, so which, which exper um, I mean, which so they, are, they are measuring basically the thermal conductivity of a bunch of insulator right. and uh, they are extracting basically the, the relaxation time from, uh, from there and they see basically this kind of uh, Planckian time or Lyapunov of time, which is basically the same module of some pies, and uh, but they see it in a completely different regime, so at very high temperature. Right. I mean, that could be potentially something completely different from what I what I'm talking about here. I mean, I sort of pur purposefully did not um, discuss, you know, uh, real exper experiments and so on in this in this talk, mm -hmm. um, because. Um, you know, there's lots of ways to get transport coefficients related to the h bar over kbt um and as, i mean as you're saying right and it doesn't necessarily mean that that when that's the case it's something to do with chaos um so yeah i i think what they're seeing may be nothing to i mean i mean you can't measure the butterfly velocity in some real metal so it was yeah right i mean it, it's most likely something different but and then I have another question, which is more like uh, maybe technical. So imagine now I break energy conservation softly with a certain relaxation time. Would you expect the tau entering in this universal relation to be this relaxation time or still to be the Lyapunov time? Uh, the tau entering into, you mean in this case? Yeah, yeah, for example, imagine now energy conservation is broken, but very softly such that basically the diffusive hydrodynamic approximation is still kind of valid. Uh, but then this tau is, is what? Is the relaxation of the energy or? Um, 
So if you did that, I mean, you wouldn't really have a true hydrodynamic. I mean, you would have diffusion of energy, but not at very small frequencies anymore. That would happen over, you get over some intermediate range of frequencies, I guess. So frequencies much bigger than the energy, uh, relax, uh, the energy relaxation time. Um, and so... Yeah, let's, let's say in the regime where the relaxation time is very long. Okay. So the so hydro is kind of still almost applicable, let's say. It would be basically the quasi hydro of Sasha and France, if you like. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what they... I would guess it would... Uh, I guess would be would be there would be no relation between the diffuse. I mean, I think in that in that example, what you're describing, I'm trying to do the equation in my head. That the, I think the diffusivity and the relaxation time would 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 turn up as sort of independent parameters in your hydro, and so it's not clear to me what the you know they would really be so, related. To one another. So you expect that this universal relation uh, uh, relies uh, strictly on the energy conservation or on the conservation of the charge associated to the diffusive mode. Um, I think so, but I don't know. I mean, I, I, so, I mean, that it would be a good question. Turk, try, you know, look for a solution. Uh, sorry, write down some more general holographic theory, for example, turn on some time dependent source, break energy yeah, exactly. and see, does this argument keep going? And it's, that's really n not obvious to me that it would keep working. I think that, I think energy conservation might be a necessary condition for this. Yeah. Mm. But I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions, Richard? Okay. Otherwise, uh, we're, yeah, it was, it's been a very nice but long talk. So uh, thanks a lot, everyone. And thanks, Richard, for, for your patience and for the very nice talk. And see you all next week. It's okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, uh, so, ah, it looks like there's a question. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. Could you go to the um, uh, your final slide, please, um, with the the skating? Um, yeah, Sorry. this one. this guy. Um, so the ADS two cross RD, it's supposed to describe um, Z to infinite CFT in the fixed point, right? Right. Um, but in your next formula, when I do Z to infinite, there, there's an extra factor of two. Do you know what it is? Uh, yes, so this, uh, let me try and remind myself. So this equation here, mm -hmm. so it's, you know, there's not a typo, so it's correct that the naive z goes to infinity limit. Mm -hmm. um, there's a kind of uh, uh, discontinuity, if you like. Um, and the reason is um, that in, in the generic IR fixed point case, um, the, so, so I kind of, I, I skipped over this slide. Uh, so the diffusivity, the, the way it's calculated to give these nice answers is you compute the thermal conductivity, um, and you compute the heat capacity and you divide them. Okay. And for a generic IR fixed point, both the heat capacity and the, um, thermal conductivity, um, are properties of the fixed point themselves. So what I'm saying is they just depend on the metric at the horizon, um, and they're closely related. Z equals to infinity um, is a special case because the heat capacity, so, uh, so for Z equals to infinity, both the thermal conductivity and the heat capacity are dependent on irrelevant deformations to that Z equals infinity critical point that you mentioned. So they both depend on, on an irrelevant deformation um, and and it, but it turns out they both depend on exactly the same irrelevant deformation um, in such a way that you get an ex, you can get you you still get a nice relation, um, and so the kind of um, discontinuity, if you like, between these two is arising because the if you if you if you try to take the z equals to infinity limit of the finite z fixed point, it's not enough. You have to include irrelevant corrections as well, and those irrelevant corrections sort of change this overall number out of front. Okay, okay, yeah, um, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I guess we now leave it here. Thanks a lot, Richard, and everyone. I'll see you next week, okay? Mm -hmm. Ciao. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.